So one of the things that um, Healthy Lamoille Valley has been doing for, I guess, the last seven or eight meetings is we've been starting, we, we, our steering team uh, really made a strong commitment to equity, probably actually close to a year ago. And so as part of that commitment, we've been uh, starting each coalition meeting just with an equity ground rule. And just to kind of bring those to the forefront for us, I sent them all out an email um, the, these were get provided um, by the Lamoille Interagency Network Team or LINT. Um, and so we just, we take a moment, we read one, and then we just pause for a moment before we get into the topic of the day, just to kind of remind us the importance of equity in every conversation. And so that's what I'm going to do at the moment. So uh, today's uh, equity uh, ground rule is number nine. It's safety. We recognize that we all have rights to safety but not comfort in these discussions. It is important for us to understand the difference between feeling unsafe and feeling uncomfortable. We agree to challenge ourselves to work through the discomfort and vulnerability necessary to pursuing equity and to be brave in this discomfort. We agree that personal experiences shared uh, during this work group's activities will remain within the boundaries of the group in which they were shared. We also agree that personal experiences belong to the individual, and we agree not to challenge a person on those experiences. And I will add that this is being recorded, so if there's something super sensitive in nature, um, you might not want to share it in this venue today. So. Um, so we're going to start just a really short, just framing um, presentation, and then we're, most of the rest of the meeting will actually be discussion. Um, so Brian's going to start a, a slideshow, um, and while he's doing that, um, just share that substance misuse is often an equity and social justice issue. And what do we mean by this? Um, we um, we actually really like the Robert Wood Johnson's definition um, as they define health equity as meaning that everyone has a fair and just opportunity be, to be as healthy as possible. Um, this requires removing obstacles to health such as poverty and discrimination. And we use this lens along with a few others um, when we look at substance misuse and identify the risk and protective factors that um, contribute or prevent use. Um, we work uh, to make materials and resources representative and accessible to all as um, we work on root issues also as possible. And so the next slide, uh, this is a page from our prevention toolkit, which um, we won't spend much time right now, but this is a page that actually helps us to frame conversation with community leaders and community partners and even the business community. And then I, I, we'll zoom in just real quick on a piece of data from this which is the next slide, Brian. Um, and so this page here, you know, data consistently shows us that our, our students of color, and that's the term used on the, the youth risk behavior survey. So that's why I'm using that uh, one today in this setting. Um, our LGBTQ populations um, are often at higher risk um, or higher substance rate usage. Uh, we recognize that substance misuse often increases for populations who experience discrimination, bias, and systematic inequities. Um, and this is often due because of the stigma and discrimination they experience. Um, in addition uh, to the direct targeting of these populations by the substance industry. And we recognize that this is portions of the substance industry. There are certainly um, in, you know, individual businesses who have, you know, are really cognizant and careful not to do this. Um, we hope today's conversation will morph into one, uh, into more culturally responsive and accessible work throughout the year, and that this will become an annual focus for one of our coalition meetings. Also, uh, please let us know if you'd like our team to come to your one of your meetings uh, to share more of the data. We, we don't want to spend a lot of time on data today, uh, but there's certainly Certainly lots of it out there. Um, at this point, I'm going to pass it over to Allison, who's going to share a little bit more um, about the industry tactics. 
Thanks, Jess. Uh, first, thanks, Brian, for moving the slides ahead. So we all attended a training recently from the National Behavioral Health Network really helped us to put in perspective more of, um, you know, and go deeper into the equity work and to refocus ourselves on social determinants of health and root causes. That it's really, so often we focus just on health behaviors, but so much of what we do and why people use substances is, is you know, all of these other pieces that you see here that lead to health outcomes. And so just to root a little bit more of our conversation in this piece and, you know, how often when we look at behaviors, uh, you know, there's, there's stigma, there's, there's blame, but we're really looking at all of the social determinants of health, knowing that, that it's no one's quote unquote um, fault for becoming uh, using a mis or misusing uh, substances that we look at all of the factors, the environmental factors, and there's there's so many pieces of what um, what may lead to someone deciding to use and especially use at an early age, which might lead to more dependence later in life. So Brian, can you move to the next slide, please? So some of the disparity that I'm going to focus on today really is focused, you know, externally is focused on is on the industry. And in particular, um, the tr this slide also comes from that training. And we hope to bring those presenters in. They couldn't make it today. So so we uh, we, we made a different plan for more conversation, but we hope to bring them in because it was an excellent training. But looking if we look specifically at tobacco um, and you can you know substitute in any of the industries, but really looking at tobacco, we can see how uh, the industry has really uh, in a way um, you know, been such a part of creating a disparity, especially in, with tobacco uh, looking at, and Brian, if we can go to the next slide. Um, looking at what we saw with cigarettes back in the day and what we see with vaping today and we can there there's so many places you may have seen already uh you know in the past few years for sure of how the exact same approach and whole marketing strategy that was used with cigarettes is just repeat for vape in a more modern way uh brian next slide please so that gets to like specifically if we look at specific populations that are targeted um, by the industry and especially here with the tobacco industry. We put out a blog post um, back last month about menthol, uh, menthol cigarettes and how um, and you can, you know, we've seen this slide now twice as part of this presentation, but three times um, more likely than um, uh, Black Americans are three times more likely to be using um, menthol cigarettes than white Americans. And this also, um, you know, it is something that was targeted specifically um, towards the um, towards the Black Af African American population. And Brian has a short video that we're going to show next, just um, that actually our one of our coalition uh, partners mm -hmm. across the state from Burlington uh, that their teens put together. Big Tobacco's flavor game is not new. Big Tobacco has targeted minority communities with menthol products for decades. Menthol tobacco is easier to start, harder to quit, and just as deadly as non-flavored tobacco. I'm a black Muslim woman. I face enough racism, sexism, and religious prejudices in my life. I see what Big Tobacco is doing and I'm not falling for it. Because of Big Tobacco, my uncle is in a serious battle for his life. I need to speak out. These are our lives, our lungs, and our voices will bring an end to all flavored tobacco. Thanks, Brian. And so we also know that um, people who have challenges with behavioral health, mental health, substance use uh, are more likely to use tobacco and that the industry is specifically uh, tar targeting um, those populations. So you can see even when we look, oh, you can change, Brian, that's great. Uh, you know, even if you look at uh, the impact on the LBT, LBGTQIA uh, community, uh, you know, look at this ad for tobacco, um, you know, celebrating Pride Month and celebrating tobacco at the same time. 
Uh, Brian, next slide, please. And you know, when you look at menthol as a flavor, is a flavor, and look at how youth are targeted, you know, our 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 youth, our young adults, uh, you know, they're heavily targeted with flavors, colors, everything that's attracting to them. And this picture was taken, uh, was it Monday, Jessica, Tuesday, locally, uh, of you know, a blue slushy that you know, alcoholic drink, um, and just knowing that. Uh, the industry is um, looking for their, their next generation. And so when we think about equity and all of the populations who we hope to serve and, and give that equal, that, that opportunity, like, um, like everyone in our communities, how do we think about um, the industry's impact, um, but also all the other social determinants of health and you know, round that out of like the root of the root causes and think about how, how do we, um, how do we react to this? So I think I'll, I think my presentation piece stops here. And Brian, if you can stop the presentation, we can go into chatting. And I'd like to just put out the question, you know, for feel free to use the chat or feel free here, but what's your gut reaction to what we've shared thus far, you know, in particular about the industry, but social determinants of health and, and anything else that Jessica or I or anyone else has shared thus far? Is there something you learned, for example, or something that was new to you about, uh, you know, in any of the pieces that we've shared or something this that's- is, This is April. April, um, yeah, please. Yeah, I was, I had read, what made me want to join this meeting is reading the, the blog post on all of this um, targeting by big companies, uh, uh, cigarette companies. And I was just floored by all of that. I was totally unaware. I mean, I, mean, I knew companies like that target people in general, but I had no idea that it was so uh, race driven. And, uh, and even what you're saying now with the behavioral health uh, population, I had no idea that was happening as well. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it, it became a big conversation at my house at supper time. It was, it was just really, and of course, my kids were way more aware of it than I was. So um, uh, it, it was really eye opening. Yeah, I'll add just before someone else speaks, thanks for sharing that. And I think, you know, it equally shocked me when I started to get into this work and I, and especially around the behavioral health and um, sub, you know, folks with substance use, use challenges, we really see that uh, tobacco, um, you know, falls off the list of, oh, you know, and but, we, but when we see wh when looking at um, setting goals and, and what's influencing it we see the tobacco industry and that one of the slides i showed at the beginning really impacting the research that's shared the the um vocabulary the conversation and framing the conversation and um one of the slides from that um from that presentation really really hit, hit home i think for uh, jess and brian and i who are i'm not sure if amazon uh but it was that the majority of people who are dying of um you know are dying of cancer uh and you know so people who have substance who have behavioral health or substance use um challenges are dying younger between five and 20, depending on what study you look at, between five and 25 years um, earlier than the general population. And you see, and then it says, but why is that? It's because of tobacco. And so that is, that was really like, you know, when the net next piece came up. And so how do, how do we really look at this? Uh, so I'll stop talking again, but I, that really hit me when, when that um, data point came up. Uh, who else? Something. What? What's your uh, gut reaction to this, or or thoughts at this point? Hey, hey. Oh, go ahead, Hans. No, no, no. I don't want to interrupt. You go first. Thank you, Hans. I just gonna say, I you know, I there's a part of me that'll say I'm I'm not surprised. You know that that corporations and and big businesses. Um, they're 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 really smart. They know how to, you know, try to to make you know take greater advantage uh, of of people, regardless of the, the harm that it that it causes. Um, and I guess it's it's concerning too because they play off uh, um, a human instinct that we're like we seek well-being, we seek comfort, 
and they, you know, they're inserting um, something that's really harmful. Um, so I guess it's 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 not surprising. But I, I love that video and just how the the uh, the students and the youth really pointed out there, like they're not gonna be taken advantage of, um, you know, by these big businesses really and standing up, you know, for themselves and their families and their um, community. So that was powerful. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. Um, Hans. Yeah, I guess it was very interesting to see kind of like, I mean, I'm, I'm still trying to understand, you know, some of like the audience of this, because in the video we see kind of like children saying it's our parents who have been targeted and are the consumers, right? But we are seeing that younger children are using more of these products. So for example, speaking of the work that we do with getting to why, that is the analysis, that analysis of the uh, YRBS survey, you know, in many schools, it is a concern among students that, that their peers are vaping. That's a new word for me. I, you know, I, I came to learn that word recently. And the first thing that comes into my head, you know, like, again, trying to bring this from the adult perspective to the youth perspective is how do they get this? Uh, you know, like the ages, like, can any kid just go on and buy this? Is the first thing that is in my head, like how accessible it is to them. And then the second, I guess, is something that I didn't see in the presentation. I don't know if this is something particular to developing countries. I am speaking from my country. But when you buy cigarettes at home, you usually have pictures of like lungs in a very deteriorated state stage. So you see basically burned lungs on the pack of the cigarette, kind of like as a deterrent for people. You know, it doesn't mean that people won't buy them, but kind of like it's like a ad or campaign. No exactly, kind of like to nudge them against buying them. And I wonder if something like that happens in the US because I'm sure just like with the conversation, again, back to the issue of equity, with the, you know, having a gun in the US, right? I bet the lobby for these uh, tobacco companies is huge. So I wonder if there is, you know, somebody working on this that maybe we can tap just as a, you know, thought into campaigns against, you know, use of tobacco, especially particularly the one we show on mental cigarettes. I didn't, that's a new fact for me. I didn't know that. Yeah, thank you so much, Hans. And um, I'll add that uh, we can talk a lot about our tobacco prevention efforts at a you know uh, at another time. And I'm happy to catch you up on all that. But I also, in this conversation, want to help us broaden this out to all the substances that we we primarily work on at HLV: um, alcohol, tobacco, and cannabis. And especially with the new cannabis market rolling out, and uh, I've been doing a lot of policy work and other work there, um, but really helping to think about how does this relate? How does all this relate to your equity work? And to bring those together, how does our topic relate to your equity work? Aaron, why don't you go ahead? Thanks, Allison. And, and to Han's point, I know I go to Canada quite a bit now that COVID is over, and I say that jestingly, but um, uh, Canada does have those those uh, warnings on on cigarettes there, so I would imagine it's effective. We'd be interested to know if that's actually an effective marketing strategy. Um, the one thing that comes to my mind in terms of equity, and and I had have read a couple articles about how the tobacco industry had targeted and specifically with menthol products, but you know, many states, including Vermont received an enormous settlement a number of years ago, the tobacco settlement. Um, I don't know where that settlement is at this point, but it was a pretty large settlement. And it would be interesting to know if at any point during that, with that settlement, if any data was ever identified in terms of the population that had affected here in Vermont, uh, BIPOC communities specifically, and where did the where did this monies go? I'm not trying to call out the state of Vermont, but you know, did it go to healthcare? Did it go to any type of remuneration to those individuals? I don't know, but uh, very interesting. And considering that 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 marketing is still going on from uh, the big big corporations, you know, tobacco corporations, you know, it's just interesting. I throw it out there for food for thought. 
Thank you. Uh, yeah, some of our funding is coming from that settlement funding um, or the you know funding through the through the state. But I think that um, our uh, the the tobacco industry now the the difference in the law that's shifted is that um, traditional cigarettes are are not allowed to come in uh, flavors except for menthol, right? That was the exception. Obviously, you can see why it was you know lobbied hard to keep it, uh, and so. But currently with vaping, uh, there's, you know, there's not um, a federal ban on flavors um, for there, there is specifically with um, e-cigarettes, there is in Vermont, but then when you look at disposables, there are always loopholes. So you can still see go into any of our local shops and you can, you can see plenty of, um, of vape devices that are flavored and alcohol. And now coming July 1st, actually, there you can buy um, alcohol cocktails that are already made for you. Um, and so that's also coming and also very uh, attractive to uh, young people. Um, you know, and, and I don't, we don't all also all have to talk about the tobacco industry and broaden it to other social determinants of health and really think about this issue. How does the topic of substance use and misuse, um, substance prevention intersect with your own equity work thus far or your thinking on equity? And so how, you know, can we start to move towards, uh, you know, how is that, how, how is that intersecting? How are you seeing connections? And then also what more information might you want to know that we can help help to find? Uh, some of you are already mentioning that, but to continue the conversation. Just a time check also, there's just 10 minutes left for the discussion. Great, thanks, Katie. Aaron, are you still? Uh, What's your experience out um, in the community? And I know, you know, someone, so many of us are involved already in equity work, but the conversation doesn't focus on substance use or substance prevention work. And so, uh, you know, how, how does this connect? Where do you see the, an opportunity within the work that you're doing, uh, you know, around the, the substance prevention or where do you see the need for this? See, Saudi is coming, uh, coming on video. Does that mean you're interested in? Is that a legacy hand, Aaron? Uh, Aaron was trying to lower his. Oh, head. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Saudi. Okay, I didn't know if it was a legacy hand or not. I didn't want to cut, <laughs> cut, the, cut the cue. <laughs> um, yeah. So you know, it's really curious. This is the the data and everything. I appreciate the amount of effort and, and such that goes into this, but when you when for me as a person who lives in and engages with a lot of these kids, I mean, I had a conversation with a 12 year old who had to tell me, yeah, I quit smoking, but I quit. And I'm like, you're 12, why did you have to quit my friend? Let's talk about that, right? So can, can, we, can we have a conversation about that? Can I buy you pizza and we talk about it? And we do. And so I'm, I'm fortunate enough that, that the young people around me feel safe enough to, um, have and engage in these conversations with me around not only substance misuse, but other high risk behaviors that our youth are engaged in. Um, because guess what? If you talk to them, they actually want to talk to you about it, which brings me to my point of that. It's really, I hear the concerns about the marketing and all of the things, but um, what I'm looking at is the whole, the big picture, right? And the whole and the whole frame of where things are and where things land, and it answers a little bit of Hans's question slightly of the accessibility and where do these things come from. Um, when we are looking at the people and consumers in our community, who are the people in your neighborhood? What are their lives like? What is their quality of life like? And what are they doing to cope and maintain to get by? When people are struggling and doing what they are doing. They will do what they need to do to get by. And so when children see their parents um, engaging in behaviors to calm themselves down or cope from stress or whatever, then they pick up on those things. And sometimes, not always do they get it from their parents, not always, this is a sometimes, right? Sometimes it comes from their parents. Sometimes it comes from their peers. Sometimes it comes from, from other sources where you never even may know. Um, that they had access to these things. But really, 
for me, and I say this in lots of my meetings, and y'all, I know y'all, y'all keeps y'all probably sick of me here singing this song and dance, but prevention, it, it really is about wellness and quality of life and making sure people have access to what they need and healthy coping skills and wellness strategies. The more you try to ban something or make something uh, less enticing, the more people are going to want to do it and engage simply because actually one of the one that was one of the responses that I got from one of the youth that I was working with, right? Because they wanted they wanted to rebel and be cool and do something that they weren't allowed to do, not because they wanted to smoke and thought it was appealing, <laughs> because they were trying to piss their parents off. <laughs> so, right? So when we do these things. You know, we have to think about all of the angles on, you know, are we setting some folks up to, to want to use out of, out of that response and respect and at the same time in preventing youth from having access to these things, making sure the adults in their lives have access to the wellness, healthcare, and things that they need so that they can be whole functioning, healthy humans to lead by example because we know that emulation is a thing. And so it's it's a yes and, you can't take one without the other. And banning, um, I don't know if you've ever seen when someone's trying to quit smoking, I've seen some a lot of violence happen during when people are trying to quit smoking and from adults, not children, um, from adults. And so for me as an advocate for, for youth, I worry about the safety of, of families and you know, just those nuclear systems on how are we ensuring the safety if we're gonna say we're, we're decreasing access to these things for adults, not saying they're healthy, I'm not saying they're healthy coping skills, but if we're gonna take away, what are we replacing them with? What are we giving them access to? And how are we supporting them through these things so that everyone in that space is safe, well, and whole and has access to what they need? Sorry, that was a long thing. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, it's talking about risk and protective factors and, you know, seeing the big picture of, you know, what we do of build, building protective factors, reducing risk factor. I think most of us on, on this uh, call, but there are also, you know, evidence-based strategies looking at, uh, you know, on the macro level, like Jessica put in the chat that like age limits, you know, raising the age limit of uh, tobacco 21 in Vermont, which happened in Vermont, uh, you know, prior to the federal, um, uh, age limit change to 21. Those are evidence-based strategies that uh, actually make a huge difference and, you know, increasing price, increasing the tax on substances to also reduces use. Um, you know, all of these things, we, we know a lot of this based on, you know, uh, based on health, um, public health data. Um, yeah, Jessica's adding some more in the chat. So it's 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 bouncing all this, and it, of course it's not all all of the industry. You know, it's all the layers. It's the individual relationship. It's the systems models. It's the the um, relational, communal. You know, and the organizations and and the systems levels. And thinking about, of course, you know, how, how do we do this in our equity work, you know, where we want everybody to have, you know, all of us, the health equity grants and that money's coming in. And many of us are working on those locally, those grants and thinking about, okay, so we're, we're working on all of those, but how does this piece fit in or, you know, reducing all these negative outcomes related to substances specifically. Um, and it's all connected. Uh, it's all connected, but how do we also take this, you know, slightly more narrow lens of looking at the substances and uh, how does it inform what we do at Healthy Lamoille Valley and, and our equity work because we're the ones who are specifically working on substance, um, you know, substance prevention. Other thoughts, folks, because we're, I think we're almost towards the end of this part of the discussion, um, but we can add in, you know, another question in here, like, what are the things that are still missing that we still want to know about this topic? What are you left thinking about right now that you want to investigate or have us as a group investigate and just think more about? We don't have to have the answers. We're asking the questions. Hey, Allison, it's Greg again. I, I think it might be helpful to, um, you know, look at some of the substance use data, you know, broken out by race and um, broken out by other categories. The, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey has some really, you know, shocking, um, you know, you look at some of the data for the state and some of the data 
for the whole population of our community. And, and it's, it's not, um, you know, not too concerning, but then when it's broken out by some of those categories and you see the disparities between different groups, um, it's, it's really shocking. So to see what, what's available uh, for youth, but also done by adults, what I think mm -hmm. could be really, really, cool. yep. um, cause I know like the work I'm uh, doing with Aaron on, um, the health equity grant, you know, we're looking at barriers to healthcare. Um, mm -hmm. but I don't think that for a lot of adults that we look at, you know, substance use as a barrier. We, we look at what's, what's in the organization or providers who are, you know, trying to rush us through appointments mm -hmm. or things like that. But, um, I think it would be really in interesting to see some of the data points around substance use broken out by, um, some of the different demographic categories. Yeah, that's great and important. And I'm glad that it's coming out here of, you know, maybe to think about how do we all think about this topic more of how does it intersect and, you know, barriers to not just healthcare, but like as Sadia is saying, barriers to wellness, bar barriers to, uh, you know, what are the other ways, uh, coping, co healthy coping mechanisms, um, you know, the generational related um, and systemic uh, issues as well, other social determinants of health. I see who is writing here. I don't know, uh, Martina. Um, yeah, do you want to unmute and just say what you're? Oh, I was just. I'm not not sure if this is helpful and you know what what we in the coalition can can do about this. But when when I was you know hearing Hans earlier talking about access, I was just talking with students from middle school, um, and this was not in Lamoriel Valley. Uh, just to to you know put that out there, <laughs> but um, I, we work all over the state, but, but this was um, in, in, in the school just anyways, not gonna, I'm not gonna throw anyone under the bus here. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so uh, the local general store is accepting some extra cash from pretty young kids to, to sell them vapes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we Jessica put Jessica put in the chat. We are um, launching a retailer outreach campaign currently that includes an equity piece and lots of other. If you want to know more about it, um, you know, let us know. But uh, but youth, we know from the YRBS are getting it from older siblings or people they know more often than they're getting it from the retailer environment. Um, and we have all of that kind of data for folks who are interested in that. Um, Saudi, I want to jump to you. Yeah, real quick, and I just wanted to just, I, I forgot the whole point of me mentioning that was to segue into about um, just what are we missing? And and it's the, the, the marketing, the targeting and all of these things. I feel like when we put hyper focus, and this could be my racial equity lens coming in, uh, but when we put hyper focus on these things, it, it it sort of takes away, like if you think about all of the things that all of the marketing and targeting that is being put out, whether that be through movies, television, commercials, ads, uh, mainstream videos, social media, whatever, all of the targeting that takes place, the stereotypes and such that take place. So I really think it, if, if, the, if the focus were on um, broadening what is marketed in general, and I say that outside of substance use, I say that outside of health and wellness, I say that because racism and the things that people do and engage in and the patterns of behavior that people fall into, I just re uh, started following someone today who um, often gets stopped by the police because he appears his image he gets labeled as a thug and carries a license and um, he has a license to carry. And so, but he was saying that he int intentionally, that's who he is. And he could very well change how he dresses and not get stopped as, you know, as frequently, but he chooses to live his authentic life. And so I say that because society has set this standard for what it is. The things that have been projected to us and are fed to us through movies, tele television, the narratives that we receive from messaging and subliminal messaging about who we are, what we are, and how we should be exist across the board. So if, if we were to take the same focus that we're putting on prevention and substance misuse and blanket that 
with creating better imagery and marketing and things that are being put out for people in general, what kind of outcomes would you have as opposed to pigeonholing yourself in a system to where you're getting resistance and pushback because there's other things. So I just wanted to say, that was my last sentence just because we were talking about marketing, um, marketing and targeting and the, the, the mindsets and ideologies that we as American people have comes from that as a whole. And so when we're thinking about all of those things, if we could think, include that in that I think that'd be a lot more effective if that made sense. Yeah, we yeah. need to have lots of strategies for sure on, on lots of levels, which, uh, you know, we have plenty of interventions. Many of our agencies are already working on that relate to a variety. You know, this conversation is about, you know, showing some of the inequity and where some of that comes from, right? Some of it comes from the industry. And as one of the slides I showed, you know, some of it comes from all, all many other social determinants of health. And um, I think, you know, if, as we start to move through more of the conversation and, and go beyond this, this is our opening conversation on the topic, you know, how, um, how do we think about uh, the needs and the, for information, like Greg was mentioning, more of the data or also more, uh, you know, listening sessions and conversations and really learning more about the impact here. And then what, how do we look towards the strategies we use um, to reduce the inequities? And I think that's the point. And, and you know, if folks want to say, along the way you've been sharing things that you've learned or things that have come out but if there's anything specific and I love what's going on in the chat too and take trying to take note it's a little hard when I'm facilitating but um you know if there's any other final thoughts for this part of the conversation that anyone's thinking about right now as just something that uh you know take away from this conversation or how you might bring it back to some of your own equity work love to uh, hear a couple of thoughts Well, that will keep coming. I think Allison, yeah, for the sake of time, let's pass it off to Em. And then one of the things just to highlight that we're planning to do over the summer, we're not going to have Cole try to do Zoom coalition meetings in July and August. People have like, they've checked off of Zoom. Um, but what we would like to do is just kind of meet up, you know, bring you an iced tea or lemonade and, and just kind of like have these deeper conversations. And if there's two or three people that wanna to come together, you know, at a park or picnic table, that's kind of the vibe that we wanna do this summer is really a lot of sort of listening to what you in your work are seeing and how we can support that. So um, I'm gonna pass it over to Em uh, to share what she's working on and some steps going forward. Yeah, so I think, um... I think, correct me if I'm wrong, we're putting the presentation back up. Uh, just give me a second, sorry. Okay. So, um, so yeah, basically um, what I wanted to do was to frame uh, another aspect of this, which is um, we, as our coalition does a lot of, com of communication out to the community and, um, we really, we utilize our website a lot. We, we put a lot of information out there and we do it frequently. And for me, the, there's a lot of considerations here in terms of equity. Um, one is how do we put out information that people can actually make use of? So it's accessible, it's understandable, and it's very actionable. Um, the other aspect is we don't want to run the risk of not understanding what information needs to be put out, of putting out the wrong information, putting out information without context, putting out information that can be taken out of context. Um, the these are you know very very loaded issues for everybody, and it's very very easy to kind of misconstrue what this information means uh, and how to use it. Um, and then the third aspect is um, we, you know, the, uh, the mantra always is, you know, nothing, nothing about us without us. So, you know, is this information coming from the communities affected? 
is uh, being curated by the communities affected? Is it useful to the communities affected? Um, so ideally what, what you would want is to come to our website, to see our social media and to have it be in the voice of the people who are experiencing it and who you know, understand it the most, uh, you know, are getting all the nuance, are getting all the context. Um, so I think you know, we're at a real starting place here and Brian's gonna talk about that more, but like we always wanna bear in mind as we move forward, we don't wanna do just like a knee jerk thing of like, oh, we've got this information, we're gonna publish it on our website. We wanna make sure that we're doing it very intentionally, very carefully, um, framing it properly and having it um, coming from the, the right people. Uh, and um, one, one aspect of this, I think, as well is that we don't just want it to be you know more and more information because we're all basically drinking from the fire hose of information constantly online um, so we want it to be actionable and understandable but also to have those potential actions embedded into the information i think so that you can say i'm going to go here and i'm going to find ways of connecting and interacting and moving the work forward um, and I will uh, pass it off to Brian now. All right, thanks, Sam. Yeah, and so really to continue the conversation we're having here and converse, you know, all the people that are interested and can't make this meeting and people that, you know, are not yet involved in this, but they might definitely want to have a voice. Um, there's this online platform called Basecamp, and some of you might be familiar with it. And so it really involves uh, an online workspace where you can do multiple things. You can chat, you can talk about ideas. Um, it can be a store place for files and documents and resources. And I already started populating that with um, a list of websites and resources that are related to this topic of equity and substance prevention. Um, you know, and it's, it's just a really a place to collaborate on these ideas and look at resources, which resources do we, you know, want to share with the population? How do we frame those resources? How do we frame this conversation with the larger community? And so we welcome you, you know, we will invite all of you and you're welcome to invite anyone else in the community to join this base camp, participate in this discussion. Um, and, you know, the plan is that we are going, this will help inform us in creating a, a web page for the public to frame this issue, to share resources with the community. Oh yeah, so if you would like an initial invite, you, Jessica in the chat put my email, which is just brian at healthylamoirevalley.org. Yeah, we don't want to add you to a group that you're like, oh, I don't really have time for that. I'm interested, I'm here, but I don't, you know, so we want to make sure that those, those who want to be on that, so that way it's the most productive group as, as possible. Um, so that format, um, probably one of the first discussion questions will be kind of a, a what, what next? How do you want this group? You know, it's asynchronous. So hopefully you're not just adding another meeting. Um, how do you want this to function for you once we've added people to that group? So the next step is if you're, this is like, yes, I'm on board. I want to do more than email Brian um, and, and get the invite to the base camp. Um, but also next step is, yeah, I've been thinking about this and these thoughts all came to me while we were after the meeting um, and we'd love to hear those. And so whether we, you just email us or whether we you know, um, meet up for, for a cup of coffee or a walk, um, we're happy to do that or come to your offices. Um, the other thing is um, we are kind of winding down, um, but I also wanted to give a few a little space for announcements um, I know that there's a, a survey out, Greg, can you speak to that um, real quick? Okay. 
put you on the spot. Is, is this the, the, the survey from the Lint meeting? No, I think this is the health equity survey that you're listed on with. Yeah. with so yeah, so it's um it's interesting because uh we initially were thinking, oh, let's let's create a survey and have you know people answer, we'll set it up in Survey Monkey. But as we've been talking to other groups around the state and an organization out of Boston called um, uh, Health Resources in Action, uh, we're really getting encouragement to consider a more qualitative approach and having conversations with people. Um, lemonades and iced teas, I, I like that, Jessica. That's that is good strategy, especially in summertime in Vermont. So. Um, Aaron and I have just been looking to extend an invitation for people who want to have a conversation uh, about their experiences, um, you know, with uh, our healthcare systems, um, looking at barriers, but also hoping that people also share ideas and suggestions for improvement. So we're, we're in the phase of this health equity work. We're looking at these next couple of months as having conversations, gathering information. And then as we go into the fall, using the input from people um, to uh, help us come up with some projects to work on. The Lamoille community did receive about $150,000 um, to, to do some work. And so, and at this point, no specific projects been chosen. So, um, you know, definitely. And, and the other thing right now is we're trying to connect with others who are doing equity work. So, so we're excited to hear about you all making the space and time today, um, but also we'll be connecting with the Working Communities Challenge, um, and their uh, equity work and uh, Lamoille County Planning Commission is doing some equity work. So, and I think that's in uh, uh, Dave uh, in the Lint uh, out of the Lint group are is planning to um, pull folks together and, and also do a survey so that we can hopefully identify how many different equity projects that we have. And that maybe it makes sense for us in um, August to, to come together and just share what we're all doing to hopefully support each other. Because we don't have a specific project yet, but we have funding that's going to be available. So we need help kind of gathering some information, but we know other groups may be in other spaces and hopefully if we come together, we can help support each other. So if folks know of anyone who's got lived experiences facing barriers, um, there is a particular focus on marginalized populations but also people living in rural communities. So anyone in Lamoille County probably if they've experienced a barrier, but we know that folks um, in certain populations are facing greater barriers. So, but if you know of anyone who wants to have a conversation or a group that you think would be interested in talking to Aaron and me, please um, let us know. Thank you, Jessica. Greg, if I could just jump in for a second in the announcements. So as folks know, like I'm involved in some of those conversations too. And I think that the, I'm wondering how to expand those questions and it may be if, you know, we might not have time right now to talk about it, but like the barriers to health care or health services, but I'm thinking about because of, you know, looking at the substance related data or looking at how the impact of substances, like how do these other nuanced, um, nuanced, areas of wellness of health fit into that question and how do we elicit more information that you know from folks with lived experience that um that might help broaden what how health is defined how health equity is defined and and um i think maybe that's what i'm saying how to, how to broaden maybe or think more about how equity is defined and how we actually um you know see ask the right questions like what are the right questions or not the right questions what are the questions that we want to ask that will help us in learn what we want to what we need to learn to be able to respond to reduce inequity Awesome. Any other like upcoming events, announcements, things you want to share with the group? I did just drop in the chat. Um, there's going to be a town hall um, feature on the opioid crisis featuring the Democratic candidates for the U.S. House of Rep um, race um, on July 28th in Johnson at Jenna's uh, house. Um, and there's an email there at RSVP, or if you have questions to ask the candidates, um, Gregory Tetro um, is the key contact for that. So his phone number is there as well. So, um, so it's good to 
you know, also bring the equity conversation into those questions that will be asked. Any other questions or announcements? Well, thank you all for coming today. We almost got through a meeting without the dogs barking. Um, and uh, thank you. And we'd love to hear more from you. And uh, we're going to give you uh, about six minutes back of your day. So thank you so much for hopping on. Thank you.